as investors, we all have challenges that we have to overcome. Now, whether you're just looking to buy your first property or whether you're buying your hundredth property, there is always going to be a hurdle, an obstacle to overcome. And some of those obstacles are real, like when it's very difficult to borrow money, or when the property market's going backwards, or when sentiments poor, or some of those challenges are actually inside ourselves and in our minds, and some of those things um, are easy to overcome and some of those things are very, very difficult to come. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about 10 of the most common challenges I have personally felt as an investor myself and most property investors or market investors in any sort of industry will come across at one time or another. Now, what you've got to remember about these challenges is that just because you've overcome them once doesn't mean they're going to come, not going to come up again and that you're going to have to consistently work through these things over time. There's no such thing as you know, being in huge amounts of debt, debt and feeling comfortable with it for the average person. So just get comfortable with that. Remember that it is an overwhelming thing to actually go out there and buy an investment property. Remember that no matter how many properties you've bought, it's always going to feel uncomfortable to actually go out there and get yourself into that debt. You're always going to second guess yourself. You're always going to compare what you bought against the top performing asset in the marketplace. You're always going to learn more in the future and realize that you probably could have done better. But these are the things that we go through as investors. And for me, um, personally, as somebody who's helped our clients buy over $250 million worth of property, I've also bought 11 properties myself in the last eight years. I feel sick, like actually sick to my stomach every single time I go out there and buy a property. So, you know, as somebody with that much experience still feeling that way, there's ab you are absolutely in your right mind to be, if you're just getting started or, you know, buying your first, second, third, fourth, fifth property, to be feeling uncomfortable. And, you know, in today's video, I hope to address some of those issues. I don't have solutions for them, only you have the solution to overcome that fear. Um, but these are the 10 most common things. So, the first one is not having a mentor or a coach. Now, I didn't have a mentor or a coach for the first six properties that I bought. In fact, I didn't have a blueprint or really anybody in my direct life who I could look at and go, that person's got it figured it out from a property perspective. I'm going to copy what they're doing and I'm going to apply that and if I apply that consistently and I have discipline, I will get the same result that they got. So. It's really, really, really important to recognize the power of having a mentor or a coach. And the way that I think about this is if, you know, you've got a training goal in another area of your life, um, you know, maybe you want to be a better mother, maybe you want to be a better father, um, you can go out there and you can read a book, you can go to a course, and you can Im improve with time. You can go and talk to your family members, you can go and talk to your friends who um, a great parents or who you aspire to be more like and you can learn from them and apply a little bit of that to your own life and it's similar if you're looking to improve your physical health like um, every now and then about once a year I um, realize I'm not as fit as I, I was or as I want to be at the time and so I'll go get a personal trainer for a month or two not because I need one or I forget how to train but just to give me that consistency to hold my hand to force me to show up to push me beyond my comfort zone and to get me back into the routine of training consistently and eating well and then once I'm back on the path, I stay on the path until I drop back off. So buying an investment property is no different. You can go out there like I did, you can buy some good properties and have some wins, you can go out there and buy some shit properties like I did and cost yourself a lot of money, you can sell too early you can buy at the wrong time, you can buy the wrong type of asset, you can buy the wrong market, or you can just learn from other people in the marketplace. Now, if you really are set on going out there and doing this on your own as a first timer, or as you know, someone who's buying a second, third investment property, just slow down before you speed up. You know, watch more videos, get more content, understand the marketplace in a deeper way so that you know you can make yourself that extra couple of percent per year long term as opposed to missing out on that huge amount of money on the table by as I said buying the wrong market having the wrong strategy buying the wrong type of property so a mentor and a coach formally or informally can be very powerful I've got people in my environment now that I respect in a massive way that I touch base from a property perspective around very 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 specific things like town planners like builders um, you know, like people that have already been there and done that. My mortgage broker owns 25 investment properties. 
one of the people that I respect most, um, you know, builds about 250 properties per year. And when you've got those people in your environment helping you get better and, you know, just going and sanity checking different ideas with them before you go out and act on something, it can be really, really powerful. Um, the second challenge I find that I've felt personally as a father, as a business owner, as a person that's worked big hours in the corporate world, as an investor, is just having limited time or not prioritizing property in the way that you know I need to or you may need to to actually get a great result. Now, I understand that particularly in Sydney, Melbourne, busy is like a word that everybody uses to describe their day-to-day -day life and it comes with this sort of badge of honor, like I am busy, therefore I have value and therefore I'm doing everything I can. And I just completely question that way of thinking and I, I personally think it's complete bullshit. Um, there's no such thing as busy. You know, I have three children, multiple businesses, lots of properties, lots of projects going on at any point in time. I'm not busy enough to focus on my financial future. And that's the way that I think about it. If I can spend 30 minutes a day or 30 minutes a week focusing on my financial future, then that discipline over years and years and years is going to result in a much better outcome than somebody who buries their head in the sand and says, I don't have the time to do this because I'm working a 40 hour a week job. Like, it's just complete bullshit. Make the time. Stop making excuses. When you're sitting in the car, listen to videos, listen to podcasts, get yourself educated. You know, instead of binge watching Netflix every night, which I do with my wife because I love it and I've still got time to do that stuff, you know, learn a little bit more, create a plan for yourself and then focus in on one suburb, one market, become the expert in that, you know, stop going broad because that is the absolute killer of this stuff. So, you know, limited time is just an excuse and it's one that I'm not going to let you get away with because there is always enough hours in the week to make time for something that's important to you and if you're not making time for it, it obviously isn't a value for you in your life or it's just not a priority at this time and that's fine. But just know that if you avoid the things that should be priorities when you're earlier in your life, you'll pay for it in terms of time and finances longer term in your life. And there's plenty of people that could have, should have, would have that ended up on the pension. There's plenty of people that just did a couple of positive steps earlier in their life before they were 50 and that completely changed the game for them and their family longer term. So. The third challenge that I find I've come across myself and a lot of investors come across is no social support and no community of like-minded people. And that has actually been one of the hardest things for me as a young investor um, and a young dad and a young business person, just having that community of people that really get you that when you tell them what your dreams and ambitions are or what your ideas are, they don't cut them down like most people do but they ask good questions about what you're trying to do and they actually are in a position to help you move forward in a more positive way. Now, I'm not talking about you know cutting out family members or cutting out those old friends. Like Those people are the most crucial people in your life and they will keep you grounded as you go through your journey. But I'm talking about building a group of people who understand where you're at at this point in your life. You're obviously trying to better yourself. You're obviously trying to set yourself and your family up for a better life. You know, start spending more time with people that are, that are like you, that are going through this same thing, that are interested in investing, that are interested in creating financial f freedom for their future. Bit of a tongue twister there, um, but not really. You know, and I know, it's, I know it's not as easy as that. I know it's not easy to walk up to a stranger and, you know, have a meaningful conversation about where you're at and, and where that they're at and find that mutual ground and have that person also be intelligent and be able to add value to your life without feeling threatened about you starting to let your light shine and you deciding that, you know, you are going to start investing in property. But it is crucial for your long term to success for over time to build relationships with people that are on the same page, that are on the same journey and more importantly than anything else, will just allow you to continue a conversation and not cut you down every single time you've got a new idea, which plenty of the people that I grew up, grew up with that absolutely love me and that are still in my life today um, have done. You know, after I bought my second property, I realized that 
Um, it's not really about talking about that stuff with those people in my life. And so I had to find new relationships with people that were already where I wanted to be or further than I ever wanted to go to, you know, make sure that I had that group of people supporting me and lifting me as I went through the journey. Um, the fourth thing I think that most investors have challenges with is just limited market knowledge. Now, it's very, very clear as of the time of recording this video, 2018, that Sydney is over. The opportunity in Sydney marketplace has now passed and if you didn't make the 80% um, between 2012 and 2018, cut your losses, it's time to move on, it's time to pull up the big boy pants and realise that there are other areas in Australia than just Sydney and Melbourne. Melbourne will look very much like Sydney is looking right now within 12 to 18 months and prices will continue to decline over the next couple of years down there or at least sit very flat. But that doesn't mean that you can't begin to understand the history around other markets. For example, Brisbane in the last 20 years has performed year on year at exactly the same rate as Melbourne. It has performed slightly less than Sydney, but if we look at the last 50 years, year on year, in terms of the averages, Brisbane has performed number one, Sydney's performed number two, Melbourne's performed number three in terms of average annual capital growth. So don't bury your head in the sand like I did because I grew up in Sydney and go, Sydney is the only market in Australia and it's the centre of the entire universe and it's this big global city and get caught up in all the Sydney hype and the Sydney centric stuff or the Melbourne stuff. Realise there are other great markets around that represent amazing value. It is your job to get your head around them. Yes, it feels uncomfortable looking at something that you don't know, but it's only uncomfortable because you don't know it. As soon as you start to understand it, like you do the place you live, over time it will become more comfortable. And to really be a successful investor, you have to become borderless long term. Of course you want high quality product in Sydney and Melbourne, but it's about timing the purchasing of that property and taking advantage of current conditions, which right now over the next seven years, I truly believe will lead to Brisbane and South East Queensland. And then we'll be ready for another major GFC and you know Sydney and Melbourne might represent much better value at that time. So the fifth thing I think a lot of investors get caught up with, and if you're watching this video, you know, you probably feel like it. I definitely know personally that this was a big one for me and that is information overload and analysis paralysis. Now, everybody online, myself included, has an opinion and it's not your job to believe what I say or what any of the other great guys out there delivering content say. Your job is to pick the little pieces that resonate with you and to collect those pieces along with your own ideas and then from that develop a strategy that actually works for you and your family without taking on too much risk, without taking on too much debt and remembering the overall timing of the real estate cycle over the top of all of that. So it's not enough to just say that I'm feeling overwhelmed because I've been consuming too much content. I've talked to people now, I've been, I've been producing content for the last five or six years now on Pumped On Property in the form of a blog, newsletters, webinars, videos, podcasts, etc. And there's people that have been following my stuff for five years now that have still yet to buy their first property. And I'm just like, you could have made 60 or 70% in Sydney by now. You probably could have made 20%, 30% on the properties in the last three years on Brisbane that we bought for the average client. There's so much potential for you to you know, take calculated action. I'm not saying go out there and rush into it and you know, if you're just getting started, go out there and do something. In fact, it would be much, much better for you to do nothing until you have a great strategy, you're clear about which suburb, type of property and market you're going to target and you know that market like the back of your hand, which <laughs> looking at mine, I don't know very well. Um, <laughs> I just had a skin check actually, so I know it a little bit better than I should. Um, but you know, information overload and analysis paralysis stops a lot of us from moving forward effectively. I know that the more I've learned, the more cautious I've become instead of playing offense like I did when I was in my early 20s. I now play defense and I'm very, very strategic about what I buy. Um, but don't let, you know, information stop you from taking action because the reality is even if your property only gets a 4% average annual growth rate per year for the next 30 years, you and your family will be in a much better position because of the compound growth effect over time anyway. And it's very, very difficult to set yourself up if you're just trying to save your way there. So 
the sixth thing that I wanted to talk about, and um, you know, I've got a couple of stories in relation to this one, is really having an average time team of advisors. And I would really say, you know, having a shit team of advisors is one of the worst things you can do as an investor. Now, for a long time, I had a really bad accountant. In fact, I don't believe any accountant is actually fantastic to be really honest with you because most accounts are just so conservative by nature that they can end up costing you a lot of money as a property investor um, and they can also send you down the path of buying the wrong things trying to save you tax on your income as well there's absolutely no ration rational thought in my mind about trying to save some money by losing some with investing it's about getting great capital growth it's about buying properties with upside in the future. It's about buying properties with great cash flow. So be careful with the accountant that you have. Um, you know, go out there and find a good one. I've changed the accountants, I think, five times now in the last 11 years and finally found one that is good enough, but I still have to manage that relationship. Um, again, if you're just working with your bank manager, that's cool. Um, they will give you money until they can't. Um, in my personal experience, I found an amazing property a few rooftops back from the beach on the Sunshine Coast, which still guts me now about five years ago. Um, I could have bought it at that time for 350 k It just resold completely unrenovated. They hadn't touched it in five years for $650,000. Now the reason I couldn't get it is because my bank manager at one of the top four banks said that I couldn't borrow money at that time. Um, a couple of weeks later, I met my now mortgage broker, Aaron. He owns over 25 investment properties completely outright. He has been there and done it all. And because of that relationship, um, I would have been able to go back and buy that property. Um, so don't let your bank manager or your current mortgage broker, um, if, you're, if your current broker isn't an investor and isn't already financially free or on their way to financial freedom, it means they're cashing a paycheck. And if they haven't done it themselves, I think there's a huge problem there and a huge conflict of interest personally because they either can't get their shit together or they're not practicing what they're preaching or because they haven't had the personal experiences and the pain associated with winning and losing in property. Um, you know, I just, I just don't surround myself with a team of advisors who aren't exactly where I want to be in the future or significantly further um, ahead of where I want to be in the future. So make sure your solicitor's quality as well your tax depreciation specialist, your town planner, your builder, your granny flat builder, your property managers, you are only as good as your team. And as much as an amazing single player in a soccer team um, adds value to the game, there's 11 players on the field and everybody needs their part. Now, you can be as good as you are or even better than the average, but you know, the quality of your future is determined by the quality of the people around you and that team of advisors is very, very, very important. So um, at Pumped On Property, when you come on board with our buyers agency, we actually introduce you to my personal team of advisors for those people that need it and that can be a really nice start for some people. So the seventh thing that I wanted to touch on is a lack of confidence and a fear of failure. Now, this has been a huge one for me personally. Um, as an investor, it's been very, very, very difficult for me to be confident in the decisions that I make, especially when I'm learning every single day and learning more information and better information. So I've gone through a process recently where I've sold um, three or four of the properties that I bought a while back um, to clear the decks to make room for what I now know, which as I said a moment ago, is really about properties that get great capital growth long term properties with great cash flow and properties with some upside potential. So as you learn more, you can buy better and better investment properties, but confidence really does come down to, um, you know, <laughs> it comes down to a lot of things, but it, for me, confidence comes down to knowing my stuff and having a set of rules based on historical performance that work for me. Now, those rules that I've built for me are only by Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane because history shows that year on year for the last 15 years they have completely outperformed every other market in Australia. I really like to buy properties either walking distance to the beach or on the water or as close to the CBD as I can possibly get, always within 20 kilometres if I can afford to at the time. I only buy houses on big blocks of land in high quality suburbs in the most premium pockets of the suburb, in the most premium streets. 
because I know that, again, those little things really add up over time. And if I throw all of those things into the mix, let's say buying a really high quality house 10 kilometers from Melbourne CBD versus buying a house in um, Bendigo, for example, I know that longer term, even though it's a bit more expensive to get in there, um, I might be able to make myself an extra two, three, four percent per annum compounded over the next 20 years. And even if it's only an extra two percent per annum, we're talking about huge amounts of money that you're leaving on the table by not having a proper strategy in place. Now, confidence is a really difficult one. Experience build confidence. Wins on the board build confidence. Losing can be a great thing for confidence as well because you get more diligent in the way that you do it. And I think I've learned significantly more from the mistakes that I've made and I've made some huge mistakes in property um, than I have from the, the results that I've got that have been positive. But you know, you live and you learn. Um, don't let a fear of failure or a lack of confidence actually stop you taking action. And there's so many people that we work with and talk to, because we do talk to about 5,000 investors per year from our free strategy sessions that we offer over at www.pumpedonproperty.com. And so many of those investors, um, you know, just don't have that person in their life to hold their hand, to keep them accountable and to call them out on that fear that they're feeling. Um, and so they play it small, they keep hanging around with everybody else who's on the same income level as them, the same number of properties as them, and they never really set themselves up or their family up for financial freedom. And why that breaks my heart is, you know, it shouldn't take you more than about 15 to 20 years if you've got a combined annual income of 100K to replace your income for the rest of your life if you're diligent. And the key there is diligent and consistent. But so many people spend 30, 40, 50 years working just because they never had that, you know, discipline to actually get their shit together to stop making excuses and to make it happen. Now, if that sounds brutal, I'm sorry about that, but you know, as somebody who's had to overcome all of that stuff coming from nothing and creating something for myself, I believe if I can do it, anybody can do it and I truly mean that because this isn't rocket science. Property is very, very simple. If you play by the rules and follow the clues that other successful people have left for you as opposed to trying to reinvent your own wheel and pretending you've watched a few videos and now you know the marketplace. So. Um, Another common challenge that people face is um, a lack of education or a lack of skills. Um, you know, completely understand that. I have an approach to my life where I am constantly learning and constantly growing. Um, you know, and that approach serves me in pretty good stead for property because property is continually changing as well. Um, you know, there's a way around that and, and that is to just get access to better information now. I produced some really cool videos, I think, <laughs> or at least some very thorough, some thorough videos, maybe not the best videos, but some thorough videos on the property industry. Um, Ryan over at On Property does an amazing job there as well with really cool content that's easy to digest and fun. Um, you know, the guys at the Property Couch do some cool videos and a great podcast as well, which I really respect. Like there's a bunch of people in the industry that are doing really cool stuff that I believe are coming from a place where they are genuinely trying to help people live a better life and achieve better results through their properties so that they can be financially free in the future. Um, I also read the Heron Todd White Month in Review Report each month which gives you a really nice snapshot of what's going on in Australia. Um, I watch the Core Logic updates each month and each week and I read all of their articles because they provide the best data in the property industry and I subscribe to a heap of the newsletters in the industry like um, John Gantz and I also subscribe to Phil Anderson's and Fred Harrison's. I subscribe to a bunch of people like Michael Matusik that just provide really nice snippets of data through to me so that I can easily digest them and we've got a newsletter over at our website as well for any of you that are interested in that, you know, once a week we just sort of share a video or some interesting ideas, generally from a different perspective than some other people in the industry. So, you know, don't let your limited education and skill set define you. You can always grow, you can always improve, you can always learn more. Um, there's some amazing books that I've read as well. One is Mastering the Australian Housing Market by John Linderman, epic resource for investors. I also, my personal favourites, Fred Harrison's Boom Bust and Fred Harrison's The Power in the Land. That guy is the king and he 
predicted accurately the last two recessions between two and seven years before they happen. He's calling the next major recession in 2026, so look out for that one or 2027. Who knows if it will happen or not. Um, and I also love Phil Anderson's book, which I'm always talking about, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. I was lucky enough to catch up with Phil Anderson recently, and I've been emailing him a little bit recently some questions too. And um, again, he's done an amazing study of the history of the US, and you can learn a lot from that because Australia is not too dissimilar. Um, the last two I'll touch on really briefly, um, no budget, no savings. If you don't have a budget and you don't have any savings like I didn't when I was just getting started, um, the easiest thing I think you can do, and we've done other videos on this, is to just pay yourself first. Don't try and budget your way and save your way out of your current situation. Just pay yourself $100 a week, $500 a week, $2,000 a week, whatever you and your family can afford before you have any of the costs of living in your life. So if you're paying yourself first into an account that you can't touch, um, that money accumulates very, very quickly. It might take you five years to save a deposit. It might take you six months, depending on your income level and your costs in your life. But don't use not having a budget or savings at the moment as a big overwhelming thing. Just pay yourself first, slowly build up, some value there and you know when you've got some money in the bank and you're in a position to start making decisions, start making decisions. Um, I know a lot of you watching this right now would be like, well Ben I've got a huge amount of equity in my home where I've got a number of investment properties or savings isn't a problem and that's completely cool. We work with people that earn 50 grand a year, we work with people that earn 2 million bucks a year. Regardless of where you're at, it doesn't matter how much you make, it's what you pay yourself first each week. So. Um, the last thing I want to touch on, the 10th common challenge that investors face, is really about underperforming property portfolio. Now, I bought some shit properties in the past, like some absolute shocking properties. Um, once I got a hot tip from someone who I really trusted, um, where I could make an easy 100k from buying a piece of land and building in western north New South Wales, um, I ended up losing $35,000 and at that time in my life I was actually only earning an $80,000 a year base and my wife was pregnant with our second bub so that was the only income coming in. So I basically worked six months of that year after tax for free um, which felt heaps nice. I love working for nothing um, and trading all that time away from my family for nothing but the lesson that I learned is that you know making a mistake is going to happen to most of us. It's not the only mistake I've made. I've bought great properties in Sydney that I sold way too early. Um, you know, I've rushed around and thought in the past it was about how many properties I owned as opposed to owning one quality asset. I'd go buy three cheaper assets. You know, there's so many things that I've learned that I've talked about in other videos that, you know, can make you a better investor. But if you've got burnt in the past like me, a lot of people that I talk to stick their head in the sand and they go, well that experience is property investing, or my mum or dad or my friend or someone lost, or I got burnt by some you know, property marketer or some spruker that sold me a really expensive house and land package or an off the plan apartment somewhere and everyone in the property industry must therefore be bad because that was my experience. And I fully get that, like I got really, really upset about losing that money just because I I knew better by that time. I think that was the sixth property that I bought and I just wasn't diligent. Um, I took somebody else's advice without doing my own research, but what that enabled me to do was create a very detailed checklist to identify if I'd consider buying an area and then a very, very detailed checklist of what I would now buy, not buy in a local area to make sure that that never happens to me again. So if you've been burnt, or if you've got a sh couple of shitty properties in your portfolio right now, like I had recently, cool. You know, make a decision to get on with it, to do nothing and end up on the pension, or to, you know, cut out, sell off a couple of those assets if they're underperforming for you. Now, that's not financial advice, that's me just saying if you've got a pig of a thing and it's not going to do anything for you over the next 20 years, it's not so much you know, it not doing anything for you and you losing money every year, but it's the cost of having that money tied up there versus the cost of having that money in a higher performing, higher quality asset. Now, I'm like eating my own <laughs> words there, like 
I've recently just gone through the process of looking at all of the properties in my current portfolio that do not meet my current goals and criteria and I made the decision to rip the band-aid off and sell a bunch of them. Yes, in 30 years time they're all going to be worth hopefully twice, maybe three times more than they are worth today. They will all be owned outright and I'll be getting great cash flow but I back myself that now that I know better I can do better and you know if you're in that same position yes you might be breaking even yes it might be a bit of a bash to your ego which it was for me but you know get on with it so I hope you've enjoyed this video around the 10 common challenges investors face I've personally felt all of them this is why I came up with this list and I know as an investor you're going to go through these things as well some of them may hurt a bit more than others some might be a bit more relevant for you than others but we all face these challenges it's going to be uncomfortable and stressful buying an investment property. Don't think that it's not. And anybody that tells you that it's not is absolutely filled with crap and obviously don't value their money enough or haven't lost money like I have before. It is a big decision and you should try and get it right. Um, you know, sometimes it is better to do nothing than rush out there and make a mistake or, you know, learn in two years' time that you could have done a lot better. Um, you know, sometimes it's easy to get sold all the gloss, glossy stuff that looks so beautiful, but you know, you'll end up realizing down the track that you've been stitched up by someone that really didn't have the, your best interest at heart. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you already haven't. Um, I'm Ben Everingham and I run Pumped on Property. Um, we've helped buy a, over 250 million bucks worth of property for our clients. If you are an investor that is feeling, you know, like you're stuck on the fence at the moment and just lacking that little bit of confidence or market knowledge you need to make a great decision, um, we are buying very, very high quality property in the Brisbane market right now. In the past, we are buying very high quality product in the Sydney market before it topped out. Um, it's 2018 at the time of recording this, so things change obviously and you've got to adapt. Um, but I'd love to offer you a one-on-one -on -one strategy session where either me or my brother Simon can sit down with you and learn where you are right now, where you'd like to be in the future, you know, help you look at some of these challenges that you are facing and help you create a bit of a property investment plan so that you can identify which market, what type of property, what budget you should have for the next purchase and move forward with confidence. So I really appreciate your time today if you're still watching um, and your attention. Have a great day and if you're going out there and doing this on your own, good luck. Realise that it's completely normal to feel this way and I wish you all the best. Thank you.